Are we are we live? Hey, you are now live. What's going on? We are back. It is uh, Wednesday night. Uh, we are week six, commandment number six. You get what you negotiate, not what you're worth. I hope everybody's doing good. I hope you're having a great week. Uh, just want to first just give you know prayers out to everyone being affected by Hurricane Harvey, everyone in the Houston area, the Beaumont area. We are, are praying for you. We are giving. Uh, it is so important to know that we are with you. So if you are in that area, please continue to pray. Please continue to give. And please, let's continue to pray for all of those being affected in the Caribbean by Hurricane Irma, especially as Hurricane Irma is making uh, her way to Florida. Please, let's just keep praying that uh, the devastation will be minimal, that the lives that God will preserve. And uh, if you're in that area right now, we're praying for you. We're praying for your protection. We're praying for your peace. Uh, if you're in the Jacksonville area, we're praying for you. So please know that you have so many people right now praying for your, your safety, praying for your peace. And also, please give. Uh, let's keep praying and let's keep giving because our giving absolutely makes a difference. I uh, also just want to address, you know, the whole DACA situation and the Dreamers. I just think it's so important to know that uh, no matter what goes on uh, in this world, we and our voice have a power. So we need to continue to fight for what we know is right. I'm definitely a supporter of DACA and supporter of the Dream Dreamers, Los uh, Sonia Doors. So want to continue to be out there letting our congressmen and congresswomen know what we want and continue to fight for that. So uh, without further ado, I'm so excited excited that uh, you all are back with me and here we are week number six with the Hollywood commandments and I've been getting all your comments I've been getting your emails I've been seeing all the responses all week long and I'm so grateful that the conversations that we're having uh, that you are finding motivational and inspirational and uh, tonight you know we're reading again from the Hollywood commandment this is my new book it comes out September 26th, so it's almost out. But if you pre-order this book tonight, and the link is right here. If you're on Facebook, the link is right there. Uh, if you're not, you can go to DevonFranklin.com. If you're on Instagram right now, and you can pre-order the book. If you pre-order the book, what we're doing, and I can only do it for a limited time, but if there is an, a motivational message that you need for yourself or you want to send someone a personalized video shout out, you can get one from me. So if you pre-order tonight, I'm going to do a personalized video shout out for every single book that's sold. And if you happen to pre-order five, then guess who I'm going to bring into the picture? Megan and I are going to do it together. All right. You got that right. All right. So if you order one, it's going to be me. But if you order five, Megan and I are going to do a personalized video shout out to whomever you want us to shout out. It could be a birthday. It could be anniversary. It could be a graduation. We just want to let you know that we are so thankful for you pre-ordering the Hollywood Commandments. And already, without any advertisement, it's already people have been doing it. And we've been making these videos. So please only make sure you know it's only up for a minute. So one of the reasons why I wanted to do this chapter is because too often we undervalue who we are. And as a result of undervaluing who we are, we negotiate against our value. When we don't know what value we create, when we don't know who we really have been created to be and what we've been created to do, when it comes time to get compensated for that value, sometimes we diminish our ability to get compensation at the level of our value because we haven't properly determined what our value is to begin with. This is why I wrote the commandment, you get what you negotiate, not what you're worth. Too often, we assume that the people we work with, the people we work for, are going to do what's in the best interest of us, which is to take care of us when it comes to compensation time. Who am I talking to? Anybody ever been there before? Anybody ever been there before? Y'all, I'm going to turn this fan over here because it's hot. Um, anybody ever been there before where you're at the job? You're, you, you're thinking you're doing the right thing, and then all of a sudden it comes time to negotiate your contract or it comes time to get the pay raise, and you don't get it? Why? Because we make a, an assessment that the person we're working for, the boss, the company, that they are going to see our hard work and they're going to reward it. That is not always the case. And I've seen this happen time and time again with people of faith. Yeah, remember the first commandment is your prayers alone are not enough. I've seen this time and time again with people of faith that we just blindly trust that, oh, God's going to work it out and he's going to make sure I get what I need when it's time. 
Well, part of how God works it out is to equip us with the knowledge and the skills to do what he has called us to do, which is to be efficient wherever we are working. So I wrote this commandment because I want you to start getting and receiving what you know you are worth. I am tired of sending, of seeing you live beneath your calling. I am tired of seeing you being compensated beneath your level of expertise. Isn't it time for finally the work you do and the compensation you get to be level? Well, that is what this commandment is all about. It's all about how you can get what you negotiate and understanding that negotiation is going to take some doing on your part. Okay, now this is what we're really talking because so often we don't like to advocate for ourselves. We're afraid. We don't want to actually say, well, no, I'm worth this. Well, here's what I really want because we're afraid that we're going to look, people are going to look at us as if we're arrogant. People are going to look at us as if we're, you know, too confident. Let me tell you something. I would rather somebody think that I am arrogant because I am confident in my worth and I am confident in articulating my value. I'd rather think that they they would they call me arrogant than to know that I went to the negotiation table and I got less than what was available to me because I was afraid. I want you to know that you don't have to be afraid to articulate and put in place a strategy to receive what you are worth. And now let me take this out of just your job and I'm gonna come back to the job in a minute, but I wanna take this to life. So many times we get stuck in life in a role that we don't wanna do, doing things that we really don't find pleasure in because we have failed to enlist this commandment into our life. Negotiation is not just going with the status quo and accepting what life gives us. It is saying, wait, I actually don't want to do the dishes. I actually don't love taking out the trash. So instead of allowing myself to be in a marriage where that is what I have found myself doing, let me renegotiate the terms. Some of you are in marriages right now. And let's be honest, you're doing things in your marriage you don't like to do. But it's because you have allowed yourself to get locked into an un spoken expectation. The unspoken expectation has created behavior and that behavior now you feel, uh, you know, beholden to keep up every day. And as a result, you're frustrated, you're mad, you're not happy. Let me give you a tool tonight. You got to renegotiate. You got to renegotiate. What does that look like? Sometimes you got to sit down with your spouse. You got to sit down and say, hey, wait a minute, honey. Now, I, I'm not, I don't like cooking every night, right? So why don't we figure out I'll cook on, you know, Mondays and Wednesdays, but every other night, you know, why don't you cook? And let me tell you something. I don't know who's on this right now, but what I love about this negotiating thing is I don't believe just because I'm a man in marriage that that means I don't share any of the household duties. That makes no sense, right? I don't believe that. I believe that as a man and a woman, when we come into marriage, we are designed to do what the marriage calls us to do. And sometimes that means, okay, I'm going to be the one cooking. She may be the one that says, you know what? I don't want to cook tonight. I'm going to go take out the trash. But this is a negotiation that we go through, not just falling into preconceived gender roles just because society has told us this is what marriage is supposed to be. And then it doesn't work for our marriage and we're supposed to be happy. You may not be happy right now because you have not properly negotiated what it is you know you really want. And negotiation is saying, here is what I want. Here is why I want it. And having enough grit to hang in there until you receive it. All right. Some of you may be in friendships and the dynamic in the friendship is unhealthy because you have a dynamic that you don't like. Every time you go out, the person expects for you to pay. Right. And because, you know, maybe you're doing a little bit better than your friends, you fall into the trap that, oh, you should pay just because you feel badly about the friend you're hanging out with. But in the in your heart, you resent it. Again, you have to renegotiate. You got to tell your friend, hey, I'm down to go hang out, but we're going to have to go Dutch. Or why don't you pay? Because every time we go hang out, if you expect me to pay, it actually hampers the friendship. I'm talking to somebody right now. I'm talking to somebody right now. I feel it. I see it. I see you, uh, uh, queen of triumph. I see it. She, she said, you better preach. Oh, wow. I love it. I love it. I love it. Roxanne said, you better preach. Hey, I'm not trying to preach. I'm trying to teach tonight. But every time we get on this thing and every time we do our, our, our weekly talks, I just get 
get excited. So y'all got to calm me down, all right? Because the preacher just comes out of me because I get so excited about what we're talking about. Because I love to take the word and make it practical. I want you to have practical knowledge that you can begin to use right now. I don't want you to fall into traps that keep you unhappy, that keep you unsatisfied, that keep you completely uh, uh, just depressed and despondent. I want you to find peace. I want you to find joy. I want you to find contentment. This is why I wrote the book. I wrote the book because I know that there is knowledge that you may be missing that could be the difference between where you are and where you know you're supposed to be. And the difference of getting there is the difference in the distance between where you are and your peace. And part of this peace is not allowing yourself to fall into roles that you resent, that you're frustrated about, that you do not like. So negotiation becomes a vital tool and an incredibly strategic tool on getting everything that you know you're worth. So I, I had a question earlier here, and I'm going to ask the question because it's one of the, the keys I already have down to get to, which is how do you know your worth? It's a great question. You have to determine how many years have you been investing in your current position, your current profession. Very important. Because sometimes we may think we add more value than we do. So one of the key assessments is how long have you been doing what you're doing? How much of an expertise have you already built up? How much of a network have you already been able to assemble based upon how long you've been doing what you're doing? So the number one key is identifying how long. Now, if you're at the beginning of your career, so I started, as many of you all know, I started as an unpaid intern for Will Smith, and that was unpaid, right? Okay, so I took the job because the opportunity was more important to me than the pay. So while I was an unpaid intern, I had to get two other jobs. I worked at The Gap over here at the Beverly Center in Los Angeles. I also worked at the dean's office at the USC Film School. I did three jobs at one time just to make enough money to be able to make ends meet. The reason why I did this is I realized no matter how much value I wanted to create, I had no track record. I had no history. I had no experience in entertainment. So I could not demand a higher salary because I had no experience to stand upon. This is why it's important to, to uh, discern and determine how much time have you been doing it. So let's say you've been doing it for a period of time where you have a level of experience, you have a level of expertise, you have a level of intelligence, and people know that you do good work. Once you know you have a foundation for your profession, then you have to look at other people in your profession doing what you're doing and begin to do research on what are they getting compensated. The Bible says, God says, my people perish for a lack of knowledge. Too often we only apply that spiritually. I want to, you to apply that practically tonight. How much research are you doing with where you work? What do the rates go for? How much is the hourly pay? How much is the annual pay? What do benefits look like for a similar position that you're in at a different company? Look at that. It's so important to do your homework, do your research, because too often we negotiate from a place of ignorance. This is why I wrote this commandment. I don't want you to be ignorant when you negotiate. I want you to go to the negotiation table with all of the information you need. And when you have that information, that information will be a foundation for your power to get what you want. Now, once you discern, determine how much, how long you've been doing it, once you've done your research and begin able to, to look at other uh, similar positions at other companies, then you then have to identify for yourself, what does compensation look like for you? Because so often we look at compensation only as money. No, compensation is also your lifestyle. What matters to you? What are the things you want incorporated into your job? So for me, while I was negotiating my contracts over the years, I wanted freedom. I wanted flexibility. So on my last contract cycle, before I quit working for Sony, my negotiation wasn't just about money. Because if you go in and you max out the max amount of money you can get. So let's say my max was 100 grand. So if I go in and I go and try and get 100 grand, understand that getting the 100 grand, if I'm successful in my negotiation, is going to come with it $100,000 worth of expectation. And unless you are willing to meet the expectation of your compensation, then you are going to find yourself not being successful because you've negotiated for something you really had no intention to keep. You have to look at what does compensation look like for you? For me, it was freedom. 
I needed a little bit more flexibility in my schedule because my speaking schedule was taking off. And at the time I had produced by faith, my first book out in the marketplace. So when I went in, I didn't go for the max amount of money that I could get. I went for a little bit less money, but then I also said, Hey, can I rearrange my schedule so I can still do the job you want me to do, but do it in a way that works with my lifestyle. Depending on where you work, compensation can take many forms of the, other than money. You may want to get home by six o'clock so you can have dinner with the family. You may not be able to get home and, and take care of the kids because you're stuck at the job and you keep working these shifts late. You may go to your boss and say, hey, OK, compensation for me is, you know what, instead of going and getting the max amount I can get right now, I want to make sure I get home by six o'clock or seven o'clock to be able to spend time with my kids. Put that on the table. You have to know what compensation looks like for you. It is so important. I see you, Jennifer Nopez. She said, this is good. I'm so glad to hear it. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. I'm so glad. If you guys are enjoying what we're talking about, it's all here in the book, The Hollywood Commandments. I encourage you to pre-order it tonight. The book comes out in, no, wait, we're almost three weeks away, so the book's going to be out. But tonight, we're doing a pre-order that if anyone that pre-orders, I'm going to do a personal video shout out to you or anyone in your family or your friends. It could be happy. Happy birthday. It could be happy anniversary. And if you order pre-order five, five copies, then I'm going to get Megan to do the shout out with me. So going back to negotiation, so important. You have to know in your heart of hearts that you are valuable. You were born valuable. When you were born in this earth, in this world, you were born with the value that God spoke into your spirit, the talent he put into your being. You need to know that when you look back in the mirror, the person looking back at you is a person of value, a person of productivity, a person of worth. If you don't believe that you are worthy right now, then you are going to miss the opportunity to begin to begin to negotiate for that worth. I've seen so many people. There was a dear friend of mine who was in the process of negotiating a contract at work, but because they didn't have a high value of self-esteem, they went in and negotiated compensation that was far less than what they were worth. And it had nothing to do with the job they were doing, but it had everything to do with how they were looking at themselves. I want you to know that you are worthy and that you are a person of value. Go ahead and just write that. We do our weekly affirmation. Go ahead and say, right, I'm worthy. I am 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 worthy. Go ahead. I love it. I am worthy. There it is, Stacy. I am worthy and valuable. That's right. Yes, that's right. What's up, Chizzy? Exactly. Thank you, Chizzy. I appreciate it. Hey, what's up, Michelle Williams? What's going on? What's up, Charlene? How y'all doing? Come on. Come on. Come on. I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy. Get this in your spirit. I am I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy. I am worthy because if you don't believe you are worthy, if you don't believe you are valuable, then every time you have an opportunity to get compensated relative to that value, you will undermine yourself because you don't actually think you are worth it. If I could just come to the screen right now and hug every single one of you, I would do it. And I would say you are worthy. You are worthy of the best. You are worthy to be treated the best. You are worthy of the best that this life has to offer. I need you to know it. You may not be in a situation now where you're getting it, but that doesn't mean you're not worth it and you're not worthy of it. You are worth the best. You are. You are. You are. I don't know if you know that. You may be going into a dead end job. You may be going into a job that makes you depressed every single day. But please don't allow the job to seep into your spirit. Because just because you're in a job that may not value you, please don't devalue yourself. You got to keep your value high. And again, I'm going to come back to the message, but I got to give this to whoever's dating out there. You got to keep your value high. Please don't lessen your standard just because you want somebody uh, to, to date you or to go out with you or to hang with you. I've seen too many people lower their standard in dating because they don't feel the, self, the sense of self-worth they need to feel. And as a result, they date down instead of dating up. Whoever you're dating, they should be taking a step up to date you. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but now we're getting started. Whoever is dating you should take a step up to date you, not a step 
down because when you know your value, when you know your worth, you know you are worthy of the very best that God has to offer. And that can take many forms. It can take forms of money. It can take forms of job, but it can also take forms in your dating life. Please don't date down. Do not date down. Do not think you have to lower your standard just to be accepted by somebody. If somebody doesn't value you for who you are and what you stand for, and they want you to compromise what you believe, what you stand for, what you have, what you know God is doing, if they want you to compromise that, they are not worthy of your airspace. I'm talking to somebody right now. They are not worthy to share the oxygen that you might put in that conversation because anyone that God has sent to be with you he will have already told them how valuable you are, and they will not make a request of you to diminish that value. As a matter of fact, the person that God is sending to you, they want you to keep your value high because God has revealed to them who you are, and they know how important you are. They know how amazing you are. And any person you're dating that cannot handle the capacity of your worth, let me tell you, drop them. Just go ahead and drop them. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. I don't know who I'm talking to right now. Stacy said, this is good. This is good stuff. Thank you, Stacey. Hey, What's up, Kita? Yeah, I don't know who I'm talking to right now. Because in order for you to get what you are worth, you have to begin to take control over your life, over your job, over where you are going. If you don't take control, whatever situation you're in, whatever person you're dealing with, they're going to get control. Part of the negotiation, one of the reasons why I wrote this commandment is to help you get control back in your life. And there are some people right now that you have outsourced control of your life to. Why? Because every time they want to do something, you don't speak up when you don't want to do it. You've allowed them to drive your energy. You've allowed them to drive your career. You've allowed them to drive your relationship. Let me tell you, you are valuable. You don't let anybody just drive you. You got to say, no, I don't want to go here today. No, I don't want to do that right now. Begin to take control back. You get what you negotiate, right? And part of the negotiation is not assuming that because I know I'm worthy of the best, that I'm going to get the best. No, the reason why I want you to know that you're worthy is so then you can begin to put yourself in a circumstance where you can get control of your life in a way that the yet your life mirrors the worth you already know you have. When you know you have worth, but you allow your life to be less than your worth, you will never be happy. You will never be peaceful. You will never be content. You will always have a spirit of discontent in your spirit because you know that here is your worth and you know you're living beneath your worth. But when you begin to take control and negotiate, what does negotiation do? Negotiation says, I know my worth. I'm going to advocate for my worth. I am going to articulate for my worth and I'm not going to accept anything that I'm less anything that I'm less than. And so what happens is all of a sudden, as you begin to take control of your life, you allow your life to get at the level of your worth. And when you feel like you are getting from life what you are worth, you're going to be happier. You're going to be more content. You're going to be peaceful. You're going to be joyful. Your energy is going to go up because now you're going to see, oh, wow, when I took control and I advocated for myself, here is what happen. Again, I don't know why God is telling me to say this. I just have to tell you what, what he's telling me to say. In your dating life, in your dating life, please, please, please don't date down. Do not allow someone you're dating to be here you are and this is where they are. If you know you have an imbalance in your dating life, in your relationship, I encourage you to either balance it out or get out, all right? You seen that movie, Get Out? Get out of the sunken place when you are in a situation where you know you are more valuable, you know you are more worth more than the situation is allowing for. Get out of the sunken place. I don't know who that's for, but get out of the sunken place. Um, one of the things that I, I wrote here, you know, is don't let humility undermine your value. Now, there's a scripture that I wanna read, which I wrote here, which is this. First Peter five and six says, humble yourself, yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. Proverbs 11 and two says this pride leads to disgrace, but with humility comes wisdom. So often we take these verses and we take that to mean that, OK, if I humble myself, that means I need to not articulate and advocate for my value because my humility is telling me, no, you know what? I should wait. I, I really will. I don't want to ruffle any feathers. I don't want to disrupt the boat. No, you're misunderstanding what the text is saying. Humble yourselves before God 
We have to defer to God's power. That is not code for diminishing ourselves in front of people. That is not code for diminishing ourselves on the job. Humble ourselves before God. We recognize that it's his power that we need to do what we've been called to do. But that does not mean that we should go in and receive less than. This is not about servitude. No, I don't. When you go to negotiate, your humility is that, you know what? I know God is in this, right? But as it relates to going and getting what you know you're supposed to get, have a sense of dedication, a sense of integrity, and a sense of fierceness as it relates to articulating what you know you are worth. Too often, I have seen people of faith let a misinterpretation of humility get them in a situation where they do not speak up for themselves. I've been there. I've been there where I thought I was just being humble by accepting whatever they offered. And then once I received something from my previous job that was less than what I knew I was worth, I was mad. And then I was the one that had to live with it. Let me tell you something. God wants us to be humble before him. But as it relates to going and getting what we know we're supposed to get, part of the power is recognizing, Lord, give me the ability to not be afraid. Because in the Bible, it also says the Lord did not give us a spirit of fear, but a power, love and a sound mind. So part of false humility wants us to think, oh, it's OK to just accept what is being offered. Not so. Some offerings that are being presented to you, the enemy will allow an offer to come through that's less than your worth. So God is telling me to tell you it's so important. Do not allow false humility to enter into your negotiation. Here's another uh, uh, passage I highlighted. As people of faith, we have a hard time assessing our value and fighting for it. While scriptures, while scripts, while learning scriptures, you never hear pastors or elders say this. Here's how you negotiate. Here's what you need to know when you're navigating your career and it comes to sign, time to sign a contract. Too many of people of faith are ill-equipped to successfully navigate the ins and outs of career advancement, of which negotiation is an essential part. Humility isn't code for being a doormat and allowing people or companies to walk all over us. When it comes to negotiating for what we are worth, we can't be overly humble about the value we create. Never be afraid of articulating your value or being clear about what you want and why you want it. This is what negotiation is all about. What do you want? Why do you want it? And you're going to articulate how to get it. One of the other things that's so important about negotiation as it relates to this issue of humility, it's all interconnected to worth. When you know you're bad, when you know you study to show yourself approved, when you know you create value, when you know you have an incredible network, you can go into the negotiating table feeling good about who you are and what's getting ready to happen. Do not be afraid of the other person you're negotiating with, whether it's your boss, whether it's a company, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in your relationship. I don't know who I'm talking to right now, but you cannot be afraid of the other person you're negotiating with. Because so often we think of that person and we're afraid of what they're going to think about what we're getting ready to ask. I need you to know, I want you to be more concerned about going after what God has called you to go after that you have enough holy boldness to ask for what you know you are worth and what you believe you're supposed to have instead of allowing the fear of what somebody else is going to think to stop you from going forward, getting what you know has, may have already been promised to you. I have come across so many people that they're so afraid of what are they going to think? God bless your heart. Let them think what they're going to think. All right. I want you to write this right now. Say, I will not let fear ruin my negotiation. Go ahead. I won't let fear ruin my negotiation. You better go ahead. I won't let fear ruin my negotiation. I won't let fear ruin my negotiation. Uh oh, there it is. There it is. Teresa Johnson saying holy boldness. There it is. There it is. Kyra, there it is. Last week at work because she had to walk away from an ultimatum. There we go. Yes, boldness. Come on. There we go, Brian. I see you. I see you. There we go. I won't let Pre fear ruin my negotiation. There it is. There it is. What's up, Troy? How you doing? There it is, Miss Love Delight. There it is, Joan Colleen. There it is. There it is. There it is. The real one, unique. Well, come on. We having a good time because fear will disrupt every good thing in your life. Everything, everything, everything. If I'm afraid, then I will never go and ask for what I know I want. I will never articulate my value. I will never get what I'm worth. So we have to come against fear right now. I will not let 
fear ruin my negotiation. If those of you who are just tuning in, we are reading and we're going through the Hollywood commandments. It's commandment number six. You get what you negotiate, not what you are worth. Okay, here's the other part. Become keenly aware of the value you create. We talked about that earlier. One of the things I need you to know in terms of creating value and you're on the job, you have to look at, okay, what is the impact I'm having? Who am I touching? How is my work being reviewed? How is the, what is the response to my work? This is how you begin to uh, identify the value that you're creating. When I, you know, I'm here, you guys know, as we've talked about for you guys who've been following me every week, we do these tapings right here live in my office at Franklin Entertainment. Uh, I have a deal with 20th Century Fox to make film. Uh, I'm in the building where they shot Die Hard, all right? So, you know, we are right here in Hollywood. And one of the ways that I was able to get here was I became keenly aware of the value value I was creating by making films of faith. Once I began to realize that the films that I knew how to make, going all the way back to Not Easily Broken, all the way back to, to Jumping the Broom and Sparkle and Heaven is for Real, Miracles from Heaven, and now The Star, which comes out in November. Once I became aware of the value I created, then I was able to put myself in a circumstance where I could begin to articulate that value and negotiate for that value. I don't know what job all of you are in, but whatever job you're in, you have to look at yourself and say, okay, what value am I creating? And you may even want to go to a coworker or go to a superior and say, okay, how am I doing? How is the work that I'm doing? Because the feedback you get helps you identify where is the value that you create. And wherever the value creation is, is where your compensation is. Wherever the value creation is, is where the compensation is. And when I was not aware of the value I created, I was not compensated at the level of my value. So it's so important to explore how, where is my value creation? How much value am I creating for the company, for the organization, for the relationship, for the marriage, whatever circumstance it may be where you need that level of negotiation. It's so important to identify the value because then you know, once you understand how much value has been created, then you know, okay, here's how I can articulate that. Um, here are two steps that I wrote down in the book. If you guys have the book, those of you on the launch team, page 138. Um, the question is this, how do you gain confidence to do something you've never done? And I had two answers to this. One, you have to affirm that what you need has already been ordained. Sometimes we have a desire, right? So negotiating is about going and identifying what you want and, are, and finding a way to get it. Uh, sometimes you want things that you may not have done before, but you know that God is putting your spirit to do it. So one of the things I wrote down and the way you go after that is you have to affirm that it's already been done. You have to affirm that what you need has already been ordained. If you don't believe that you serve a God who has already gone before you to meet your need, it is going to diminish your capacity to go after what he called you to go after and negotiate for what he told you to negotiate for. I need you to affirm right now it has already been ordained. What has been ordained? Your success has been ordained. Your promotion has been ordained. Your gift has been ordained. Your talent has been ordained. Your, uh, do you realize that before the foundation of the earth, God already knew what it is he wanted you and I to do? And as a result, he's already prepared the way. And whether or not we achieve it is not related to what God wants to do. It's totally about what we want to do. This is why I wrote the Hollywood Commandment is because I want you to receive every good thing that God has already ordained in your life. But one of the ways to do it is to believe that it has already been ordained. That means he's already done it. Can you go ahead and affirm that? He's already done it. He's already done it. He's our, I love it. Y'all are already ahead of me. Go ahead, Sophia. Go ahead, Vanetta. Go ahead, Courtney. There it is. There it is. Go ahead, Crystal. Crystal Willingham. My success has already been ordained. There it is. There it is. There it is, Addy. There we go. What's up, Kyra on Facebook? There we go. What's up, MB, M-I-B-S-T to come? There it is. My best to come. Hallelujah. There it is forever. There it is, Chris, Christian. I love it. It is already done because when you know it, then you have the confidence to go after it and you don't worry about what people say. You don't worry about the obstacles in your way. You are only focused on receiving what is already has your name on it. And part of this is understanding that even when you're in a situation and you have a want and it seems unfamiliar that you can actually get it made, you have to ordain it first. The second thing I wrote is you have to claim it. If you have money waiting for you, if you have an opportunity waiting for you and the only difference between you receiving it is whether or not you claim it, would you leave things unclaimed? There are every year there's a list that comes out of people who have unclaimed tax returns, money that is already you know, written out to them that they have not gotten. 
Let me ask you some, why would you allow there to be a blessing in your life that you don't claim? One of the blessings in your life is to know where you're going, to believe that God has already ordained it, and then you begin to claim it. You begin to speak life over it. You begin to say, yes, it is done. Yes, it is going to happen. Yes, it has already happened. I am just walking this thing out. If you want love, you have to say, yes, I claim that I'm finding love this year. Yes, I claim. I claim I'm finding a relationship. I claim I'm finding the right job. I claim I'm moving moving forward in my career. I claim I'm going to receive my destiny. You have to claim it. You have to claim it because when you allow it to go unclaimed, you allow yourself and myself sometimes to operate in fear. And this is all about eradicating fear. You have to claim it. I tell this anecdote. Years ago when I was traveling, I would seek out airport bookstores, go over to the bookshelves, touch all the New York Times bestsellers and say, I claim it in the, New York, in the name of Jesus. I was claiming that I was a New York Times bestselling author even before I became one. Eventually, my last book, The Weight, became my first New York Times bestselling book. <laughs> Do you realize I would literally go into airport after airport, and before I became a New York Times bestselling author, I would go and touch the New York Times bestselling author list. I would touch books that were number one. I say, I claim it in the name of Jesus. I know I'm a New York Times bestselling author. I know it. I know it. You got to start claiming some stuff. I need you to break out of your holy shell tonight and get bolder in your faith. Get bolder in your audacity to believe that you can get whatever God has already ordained for you. And part of the way to get it is to claim it before you even go in to sit down and negotiate. I claim this negotiation is going to go well. I claim that God has already gone before me and prepared the way. I claim that they, they are going to be so blessed just to negotiate with me. That's who you are. And that's how I need you to think. I really want you to know that as we are, are getting to this place where it comes down to whether or not we believe it and we can articulate it. Uh, a couple other things that's so important is, you know, sometimes you need a team. You know, in many professions, you may need an attorney or you need an agent to do the negotiation for you. Don't be afraid to get a team around you. I have found that in order to get a, a negotiation to become successful, you do need a team. And sometimes that may be an attorney, it may be a lawyer, it may be advisors, it may be other people, mentors that you have in your profession or your field that can give you advice on what to ask for and how to ask for it. One of the other tips to, success, to successful negotiation is to not be afraid to walk away. When you are afraid to walk away, then you allow yourself to be subject to whatever the other person wants. But when you have made up in your mind that this is what you want and you're going to hang in there until you get it and you are not afraid to say, you know what? I may have to leave this job. I may have to leave this relationship if I can't actually get what I want. Being ready to walk away empowers you. It gives you power in your negotiation. Whoever doesn't want to walk away in a negotiation is the one that is more apt to compromise and not get what they want. I need you to know it. One of the other things that I people tell me all the time, and I want to take some questions in a minute, people tell me all the time is, well, what if they get mad? What if they get upset? No boss who has worked in their profession is going to be mad at you for having a vision for your life and what you believe you are worth especially if you've already been adding value to the company. Now, they may not see it the same way you do, and they may not be ready to give you the compensation you want, but don't be afraid of their reaction because in many negotiations, you start a little bit higher than you're worth so that when you get done with it, you may end up at a place where it's finally leveled out at your worth, right? So please do not be afraid to start high. Don't be afraid to say, hey, this is what I think I'm worth. And, and, and not worry about how they're going to react because too often we go before ourselves. We anticipate what their reaction is going to be. We think it's going to be negative. And as a result, we go ahead and downgrade what we really want when we go to the negotiation table. Stop doing that. Go with your best Go with what you know you want and then allow the negotiation to take process. Now, one of the other keys to successful negotiation is get your emotion out of it. OK, sometimes we're just too emotional. Can we say that we're just too emotional? All right. Sometimes we are just too emotional and we allow our emotions to get the best of us. Mm -mm. You got to take emotions out of this. This is about business. This is about getting what you know you're worth. It's about getting what you know you're supposed to have. And part of that is to not allow your emotions to get in the way. Remember, I told you earlier uh, in, a, in a few uh, commandments ago, you know, as people are interested in their own self-preservation. Right. And, and too often we allow our emotions to get in. Oh, they don't like me or, oh, you know, they're treating me bad. No, they're not. 
They're just doing business. And the company's business is to get you to agree for less. That's what they want you to do. They want you to do more work for less money. That's what the company is trying to do. All right. So once you know that, then don't take it personally. Don't take it personally. The first time when you ask for what you want, they say no. Okay. All right. Well, what do you guys want to do? Because this is what I believe I'm worth. All right. So don't be afraid. The first attempt that they may push back. That's okay. The life's going to push back, but it's not about how life pushes back at you. It's about how you and I push back at life. And that's what this chapter is all about. I want you to become a beast at negotiating. I want you to have the information, the resources, the team. I want you to have no fear. I want you to know your value. I want you to know your worth. I don't want you to be afraid to walk away. I want you to operate in faith. I want you to know that you deserve every good and amazing thing that God God has planned and ordained for your life. Okay, y'all, listen, when I get to talking, this is just what happens. All of a sudden, it's 40 minutes. I'm like, how have I been talking for 40 minutes? But this book, The Hollywood Commandments, it just, it's in my spirit. I wrote it because I want to help you. My desire is to help every single one of you walk out your calling. It may be in the secular world. I don't, you know, it may be in the spiritual world, wherever it is. I really don't care. I just want you to do what God has called you to do. And I want to give you the information and knowledge to do it. This is why I poured my heart and soul into this book. This is why when we start talking about y'all can't shut me up because I'm passionate about it. Okay, but here's what I want to do. I want to take some questions. I want to take some questions. Oh, thank you so much. Denise says that uh, they, you guys appreciate me. So thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Nikia. I see you. I see you. I, I see you, Miss Love Delight. I see you. I see you. Right on. I see you. Natural Head Beauty said, I missed the first 40. Well, we're going to put it up on uh, my Instagram story so you can go back and check it out. What are your questions? What are your questions? Okay. Uh, is it wrong to apply for a position without a bachelor's degree if they are requiring one? This is a great question, Monet. You know, on your, your, your job application or if you're putting in your resume, if they're requiring it, you can still go ahead and apply, but you must also know that they potentially might reject you just off the top because you may not meet the minimum requirements. So part of your faith walk is to say, let me go ahead and apply for the job, even though I may not meet the requirements. Let's see what God wants to do. If you could call them for the interview, then there you go. God is working it out. If you don't, that's okay. Find a similar job that may not have the same requirement and go ahead and pursue it. Or if you're in a field where the requirement is a bachelor's degree, then I would encourage you to find a way to get that degree. That may be taking night school, maybe going on, you know, going online. I know there's a number of online universities that can really help you get that degree. But the first thing you, the thing I don't want you to do is give up. Don't give up, Monet. Don't give up. Stay in there. Hang in there. Be persistent. And sometimes you'll never know what the response is until you take a step of faith and you try. Okay, this is uh, my best. My best to come says this. How do you start over without beating yourself up personally and professionally? Great question. How do you start over? This is going to sound crazy, but you start over by literally acting as if the thing that you're frustrated about, the thing you're guilty over never happened. You got to just erase. Remember Men in Black, all right? They would take the, the pen. This ain't quite it. But they would take the pen. They would put the thing and say, okay, you know, you forgot, right? Because we have to get out of our head. Things that are over and done, we can't go back and fix it. So the best way to fix the past is to do better in the present to set ourselves up for the future that we want. So personally and professionally, we all have decisions that we regret. If I mean, I wish I could tell you all the things I regret personally and professionally that I've done. But the way that I didn't allow those past things become current speed bumps is by acknowledging I did it. I made that decision. If I had the information I had now, I would make a different decision. So let me put it to rest. Let me grieve over it. And now let me become better for it. So any decision in your past that is still haunting you, I want you to stop reliving it to the degree where it's impacting your present and your future. And part of it is letting yourself off the hook. Yes, that you may have made the decision. You would do differently now. Ask yourself, ask God for forgiveness, forgive yourself and keep moving. So important to do it. And when you do it and as you start, you know, finding positive things to focus on currently, you're going to find yourself getting over that old thing. Because sometimes things that happen in our past professionally and personally that we don't like, things that we regret can actually help us become better people much more integrity, much more character, because we learned a lesson from those previous things that now have made us become better in our present and our future. Okay. Uh, I love it. I love it right here. I love it. Uh, Joy, thank you for getting a copy of the book. I appreciate it. I love it. Um, Selena says, how to discern when it's running away uh, versus giving up? Great question. How do you discern if you're running away versus giving up? Because it's all about your spirit. When you or I give up, 
We give up out of a sense of desperation. We give up out of a sense of hopelessness. And we give up in part because we have lost faith over the thing we were hoping would happen. This is how we know there's a difference between giving up or trying a different way. When I remain committed to the goal God has told me to pursue, but I have said, okay, let me try a different way. I check my spirit. Am I enthusiastic about the different way? Am I hopeful about the different way? Or am I resting and feeling the sense of defeat? That is the difference in knowing whether or not you're going a different way or you're giving up. It's so important that in your career, in my career pursuit, we're going to have to make adjustments. That means we're going to have to make uh, choose different ways all the time. But we still are pursuing the main goal God called us to pursue for our life. But when you decide to throw in the towel and just say, you know what, I'm tired of doing this. It's never going to happen. That is when you know you're on the verge of giving up. And I would encourage you not to give up over anything God has promised you. Any talent you have, anything you know you have a gift for, please do not give up. You don't realize how close you are. You don't realize how the enemy wants to prevent you from ever doing what he's called you to do. No. Sorry, y'all. We had to decline this call. Okay, there we go. Um, you don't know how close you are to doing what God has called you to do. So please go a different way, but do not give up. I hope that's helpful to you. Yes, Sierra. The question Sierra asked, is the book available for, for on iTunes? Yes, you can go right now and pre-order it on iTunes. No matter where you pre-order the book, you can do Amazon. You can do it through my website, DevonFranklin.com. You can do uh, Kindle. You can do iTunes. Wherever you pre-order the book, if you pre-order tonight, and I cannot keep this incentive up very long, if you pre-order tonight, you are going to get a video shout out from myself. If you need a word of encouragement, I'll give you one. If you want to wish somebody happy birthday, let me know who their name is and I'll personalize it for that person. Whatever you want in the video shout out, every pre-order of the Hollywood Commandments that is sold as of tonight will get a pre will get a, a, a video shout out. Now, if you order five, then I'm going to bring Megan into it and we're going to do a shout out for whoever you want us to do a shout out. Again, it could be a word of encouragement. It could be a birthday shout out. It could be an anniversary shout out. But if you order five, Megan and I are going to do it together. If you order one, you're just going to get a little old me. <laughs> All right. Our time is coming to a close. I need to. OK, what? Give me one more question. What's a good internship for a beginning author slash speaker? A great internship for a beginning author speaker is two things. One, identify who in the author space you want to be like, uh, who are the authors that really speak to you, and begin to promote their material. That is really good. Also, reach out to their organizations. Ask them, how can I be more helpful to you? Ask them, do they have internship programs? Maybe there are events that you can volunteer at. Super, super important. And if you want to be a good speaker, uh, one, begin to speak. Don't be afraid to put yourself out there. Identify what you, you want to speak about. Every great speaker has something they talk about that is a thing that ultimately gets them known. And then as a part of it, identify who the speakers are that you want to be like, who are the speakers are that you're really, you're really following. And again, find out how you can be additive to them. Um, I, I talked about this before. You know, In order to wear a crown, you must uh, carry one first. And that's one of the key commandments in the Hollywood commandments. And one of the best ways to learn how to wear a crown is to help somebody carrying their crown by interning, by servicing from afar and by learning as much as you can through what they are doing. OK, we got time for like one or two more questions. Why, what do you do when you're in a creative rut and God is silent? Mm. Love this question. When you're in a creative rut and you feel like God is silent. Um, what I have found has been very helpful is to take myself away from my environment, my surroundings. Sometimes it's hard to hear God because there's too much noise around us. So in those moments when I felt in a creative rut, like sometimes when I was writing this book or when I was co-writing The Wave with Megan, and even when I was writing my first book, Produced by Faith, I had to sometimes go away by myself, sometimes for a whole weekend to just go before God. And what I would do, and I would encourage you to do this, if you're in a creative rut, Take some time away. It may just be going to the library by yourself. I want you to take a notepad and I want you to take the Bible, put the Bible right here, put your notepad here and ask God, God, what is it you want me to know? What have I not been able to hear? And you are going to be shocked at what he begins to tell you. And when you hear it, start writing it down. And you're going to see as you begin to repair your connection with God, your, your creativity is going to return.
because he is where our creativity comes from. He's the source, right? So in order for creativity to flow again, we have to get back with the source. One way to get back with the source is to take yourself away, get some quiet time, have the word right here, read some scriptures, have a blank notepad and begin to write down what you are hearing. And this practice, it's a lot of the knowledge I'm sharing right here. It comes from that practice. Powerful, powerful, powerful. Okay, Shar Williams says, if you are passionate about film creating and producing projects, but you're not connected to the right people or the so-called inner circle entertainment industry, what's the best way to pitch your projects as an unknown filmmaker? Thank, great, great question, Shar. I get this question all the time. You know, one of the ways to do it is, you know, you have to study your craft. So I, I come across so many people that want to be filmmakers, but they aren't necessarily at the level to be a great filmmaker. Uh, first, of, first and foremost, study your craft. Make sure that the content you're making is, is at the level that the industry will receive it. Uh, tell great stories. Every good filmmaker at heart is a good storyteller. So focus on the story you're telling. And the other part that I would say is you don't have to be a part of Hollywood's inner circle to make it in Hollywood. I'm not a part of the inner circle, all right? I didn't know anybody as part of the inner circle, okay? When I came into Hollywood, I didn't know nobody, all right? Even though I was interning for Will's company, I actually didn't build a relationship with Will until a year or two into the internship. It took some time. The thing that allowed me to find success was being of service, was being teachable, and learning the business. So if you are an aspiring filmmaker, learn the business. Go to some film festivals. Reach out to other filmmakers that are your, are in your peer group. Begin to build community and also begin to identify what are the stories that God has ordained for you to tell. Because if you know the story in your heart that you're supposed to tell and you put yourself in a process to learn how to tell it at the highest level, you're going to realize that the industry will open itself to you because the industry needs you. Hollywood needs new voices. Hollywood needs new actors. Hollywood needs new uh, producers. Hollywood needs new talent. So the greater you become at your talent and your gift, the more success you're going to find in Hollywood. Is it going to take time? You better believe it. Will it take persistence? Absolutely. But will you make it if it's ordained for you? absolutely you will make it. Does my company accept unsolicited screenplays? No, unfortunately we don't. We get everyone all around the world wants to submit content to Franklin Entertainment. I'm so grateful for that, but we just don't have the bandwidth to accept unsolicited material, but we do uh, pray over you. We pray over your project and just pray that God would do uh, what he needs to do with it and that you would stay encouraged in the process. All right, y'all. Uh, how do you balance? This is from Jawan Bradley. How do you balance a nine to five job? You have to work for your family to make money and pursue your passion. Great. Here's how you maintain a nine to five job and still, and still pursue your passion. Understand that your nine to five job is financing your passion. What does that mean? Let me tell you what it means. What it means is that, okay, if you have a nine to five job, right, you're doing that. But once you get off at five, so to speak, begin to identify at least one hour a week that you put into your talent. And when you do that, you begin to take that one hour and say, okay, what do I need to do? And as you begin to build one hour, Take that hour to two hours. Take it to three hours and stop looking at your job as a dead end. But look at your job as financing the time to be able to work on your gift. This is a strategy that I use as when I was an executive for Columbia Pictures, when I had dreams to have my own company, when I had dreams to be an author, when I had dreams to be a speaker that would speak around the world. I would use it because sometimes we get frustrated being in a job that we're in and we're like, oh man, it's never going to happen. But once I began to realize, wait, God has allowed me to have this job. So my lights are paid. The, the car note is paid. The rent is paid. So now I actually have a foundation from which I can pursue my true talent. And once I begin to dedicate specific time on a weekly basis to pour into my passion, my passion then became the platform that I stand on now. How was I able to quit my job working for Sony? How was I able to now be a producer that has my own company and make my own content, write my own books? Is because years ago, I used the job to finance my passion and my passion became the platform that I now stand on. I hope that's very helpful to you, Juwan. I hope you're, oh, Miguel, uh, Mr. Graham. Okay, right, Miggy Graham. Okay, man, I'm glad that you like that. All right, y'all, listen, I, I wish that we had more time, uh, but again, if you pre-order the Hollywood Commandments tonight, you'll get a, a video shout out for myself. Uh, whoever you want it to be addressed to, I want to encourage you. I want to say happy birthday. I want to say happy anniversary. Just go to DevonFranklin.com or if you're on Facebook, you can click right here on the link. If you're on Instagram, the link is in my bio. If you pre-order right now, you'll get that. If you pre-order five, I'm going to bring Megan into it and we're going to have you know a little video shout out to you and yours. I just want you to know that we're doing this every week because it's so important with all that's going on in the world.
to not lose focus of who we're created to be and what God has created us to do. One of the greatest impacts we can have in the earth is to be who God created us to be. Because as we do that, as we commit to that, as we stay focused on that, we're going to have a greater impact on the people we're around and we're going to be able to have a bigger impact in the world and in the earth. And this is why every week leading up to the release of this book, we're going to be here. I'm going to be here. My goal is to coach you. My goal is to help you. My goal is to inspire you. My goal is to motivate you to know that all things are possible to those that believe and are called according to his purpose. Y'all, it's been an hour. I got to go. You have to go. I'm sorry, y'all. I'm sorry. If you want more information, go to DevonFranklin.com. Sign up for my, my, my email list. We're going to be publishing the notes from tonight. So you'll be able to get these notes. You'll be able to uh, you know digest these notes so that you can get what you negotiate, not with your word. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, be with every single solitary soul that has been watching from Facebook and Instagram, dear God. Let them know how valuable they are, how worthy they are, how powerful they are, and give them the confidence to go and negotiate for the compensation that they deserve. Let them not uh, down, uh, you know, let, let them not put their standards down. Let them not date down. Let them not live down, but let them live up. Let them date up. Let them work up, dear God, because we know that we serve you, God, and God, you've already gone before us to prepare the way. So I'm praying for every career right now. I'm praying for every dream right now. I'm praying for every project right now that it would be a fulfilled in your timing, Lord, and in the process. I pray that everyone receiving this prayer would feel more positivity, more hope, and more faith to go after what you have called them to go after. In the mighty, holy name of Jesus, we pray for everyone being affected by Hurricane Harvey, the aftermath, everyone being affected by Hurricane Irma, all of those being affected by the, the fires in Oregon, and any other atrocity happening in the world. We just pray for them right now. We pray, God, that your spirit would be with them. You would send angels to be encamped about them. And dear Heavenly Father, we pray that we would stay committed to doing what you've called us to do. In the mighty, holy name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. I love y'all. Sorry I took so long. But next week, we are going to be back with commandment number seven. Let's see. Commandment number seven. You must master the walk of fame. You must master the walk of fame. Oh, boy. You're going to want to be here for next week. God bless you. God keep you.